The Musician's Map eBook is the new definitive guide on building success in music. Whether you're just starting out or you're looking for gigs or you're trying to make a career, the Musician's Map eBook is right for you. The Musician's Map eBook contains 20 years of music industry experience distilled into a 40,000 word guide to achieving your goals in music. Can't read? Get the Musician's Map audiobook. Four and a half hours of author Kane Power speaking directly into your own ears. That's right, even you can still benefit from the Musician's Map Guide to Building Success in Music. Head to musiciansmap.org forward slash books right now to get your copy of the Musician's Map ebook or audiobook. Get it today and receive a special one time only offer of a personal pat on the back from author and podcast personality Kane Power. The Musician's Map ebook and audiobook is also available at Amazon and Audible if you feel like supporting those giant websites as well. The Musician's Map ebook, your guide to building success in music. Proof of purchase required for Pat on the Back. To receive a Pat on the Back, you must travel to Raglan, New Zealand. Travel not included in purchase price. Welcome to the Musician's Map podcast. This week is the second installment of Our Worst Gigs, where previous guests of the podcast share their most painful, embarrassing and hilarious gig stories for your entertainment. We have 10 artists and I think maybe 12 stories. Maybe you've even got a few stories yourself. We have an incredible lineup for this episode and some unbelievable stories from all levels of gigs, from busking on the street right up to major international tours and record label showcases. Let's dive right in with my guest from podcast episode 18, Paul Martin. Paul is the bassist for alternative metal band Devilskin, the guitarist and vocalist in metal band World War IV, and the host of the long-standing metal radio show, The Axe Attack. I'm, t- I'm trying to think where this happened. It might have been in, might have been in Christchurch actually, but it was a pretty noisy, sweaty, awesome gig that it, we just finished. And um, I think we just played the encore and we're doing the thanks very much, see you later, and, and slapping a couple of hands at the front, thank you. And there's this girl. She was right at the front, and she was um, she'd been a little bit obnoxious all night, you know, just an- annoying. But there's a lot of people there, and so they didn't really focus. But oh god, I, I remember going up the front thing, and she's grabbing my leg, and I thought I'll keep away from this one. <laughs> anyway, um, end of the night, and she's there, and she blimmin', um goes to shake hands. So I I'll give him my hand. She just about pulls me over, you know. I'm like whoa, whoa you know, just caught myself. Yeah, so to be careful there. And um, now I'd had a bit of a flu. And um, he was all, we're all sweaty and just you know, yeah. you don't want to hug people after the gig because yeah, yeah. you're, you're drenched, drenched and, yeah. and they go, You're amazing, and then they hug you and put their arms around you. And you go, Oh, you're gross, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, Don't touch me, <laughs> it's like, Oh, you change. And anyway, so this chick, this annoying chick, she sees now and she's lunging for him, lunging, and he's talking to someone else over there and shaking someone else's hand. And she grabs his hand, she pulls him down, and she goes for the kiss, and he just turns his face away a bit like this. And so his face is sliding across her face, and it all happened quite quickly, but he left this massive trail of snot. (laughs) 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 And it was just hilarious because, like, she deserved it, you know. But, and he, like, he fell, and, like, it could have, it could have ended really badly. He's still wearing a guitar, but she'd pulled him over. He just caught himself, but his face had just (laughs) slid along hers, and he obviously exhaled out his nose at the same time. Yeah. Well, that will go with me forever. That was just the funniest <laughs> moment. Amazing. Did he break his guitar? Nah. 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 Check out Paul's band Devilskin at devilskin.co.nz and facebook.com forward slash devilskinnz. Next up is my guest from episode 23, Tom Larkin. Tom is the drummer for New Zealand rock legends She Heart and runs Triple V Management and Home Surgery Recordings in Melbourne. Fuck. <laughs> That's so many spots. No, and I mean... It's not that I, you know, it's not that I, 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 I'm afraid of sharing it. I think some of, the, some of the kind of coolest things to talk about are the disaster gigs. And there's two that really stand out as being the worst. One, we did a show in Norway and, uh, no, sorry, Sweden. And it was our first show and we were opening for a, a band called Fu Manchu. And this would have been around 1997. Wicked. And this was our first show with Fu Manchu, right? So we come through New York, cross over to London, get a bus, go to Sweden, get there, first first day of the show, wake up, get into the venue, do everything like that. Now, what's happened is that the whole time John's been like, oh, man, we've got to fly a guitar tech over. I need a guitar tech to do the show. And we're just like, uh, we can't afford a guitar tech. It's an extra body on the bus. We can't do it. Like, you've got to deal with it yourself. So we go through New York, and they've just released pedal tuners, 
It's yep. like, here you go, bro. Like, here's a pedal tuner. You tune your guitar on stage. He's like, oh, cool. And we spend this money, buy this pedal tuner. We got it. And this is, and he worked it up on the first show. Anyway, the tour manager at the time had this guy who he kind of put on the tour as a, as a crew guy. And this guy was all right, but he was like, you know, he wasn't a musician. He wasn't anything. And we're about to go on stage. And Phil is side of stage. He's looking furious. And I'm going, what's up, man? He goes, John hasn't got his pedal tuner plugged in. I'm like, what the fuck? Go up to John and go, hey, John, you haven't got your pedal plugged in. And he's like, yeah, man, uh, Yuri is going to do it. And Yuri's this crew guy. And I'm like, but he's not a guitar tech. He goes, yeah, but he said he'd do it. And I go around the corner, like, no shit, right? And Yuri has got John's guitar on a stand. If you know, I mean, are you a guitarist? No, no, but I know guitars, yeah. Okay, so you recognize that, you know, metal stretches and you've got to stretch the strings out and temperature affects it and you've got to keep the guitar warm at stage level so that when you hand it over to the artist, they've got to have it so that it stabilizes for stage. There's an art form. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's a dark art to be able to keep guitars in tune for artists properly and there's a lot of you know, touch and sensitivity to it. Yuri has his guitar on a stand and he's got a fucking, like a, an acoustic guitar tuner. He's plucking each string and just tweezing oh. the note, right? So, and we just like, this is like two minutes before stage and we just suddenly realized we're walking out there and all of John's guitars are being tuned by an absolute liability. And we're just like, John, what the fuck? And he's like, it's going to be fine. Shut the fuck up. What's your fucking <laughs> problem? You know? So we go out there, we play the first song. It's a, Fuck it, it's completely out of key because John shit's out of key. And then uh, John throws off his guitar and does it by himself. Then he picks up another guitar. It's fucked. Carl is so furious, he smashes his pickup into his bass. John gets his kind of fourth guitar, plays one chord, throws it on stage, and walks through the venue to the bus, goes to his bunk, and pulls the thing over. We got through one and a half songs. Oh my God, your first night. Stage. First night opening for Fu Manchu. Oh, dude. That is so <laughs> rough. It's on such a bigger scale as well. But we didn't – John was so so shamed and there was so much, like, fucking anger. It yeah. was like – like, he didn't he didn't make his presence known until soundcheck the next day. He hid in his bunk oh, until soundcheck. Dude. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, did the rest of the tour go all right then? Rest tour was great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then there's the more famous one about how we lost four million dollars in one show. So that was all right. Oh, go on. Um, <laughs> well, this is a, this is the one. There's the it's in the film, but basically we had the Viper Room show, and geez, again, it's about guitars and tuning. Um, so we had a Viper Room show. Long story short, the label had been sending various people the whole time to tell us how to do a set and construct it, and they'd kind of gotten to this point where we would have the show, we would play a couple of tracks, and then John would have a solo bit, and then we'd play three more tracks, and that would be the showcase. And this was at the Viper Room. It's the first ever show as Pacifier, Viper Room in L.A. At the time, the management team had offers on the table of $4 million U.S., from labels and they were flying CEOs over wow. to basically sign the band. And they were all really confident that we'd be basically – walking away with a $12 million offer at the end of that night. And we were going, you know, and it was like, you know, I, I had already picked out my Mustang. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we get on stage and, and the night before, John and I had, had a huge argument about it. And I was saying, you know, hey, look, you're being chopped to pieces with people's attention. You're not paying enough attention to the to the game. You know, you forget about the hell of the LA thing for a minute. Let's just try and deliver as a band. No, nah, no, nah, you're just jealous. Fuck you because you're the drummer. Da, da, da. Um, anyway, we get on stage, we do the first two songs. They go, all right. And we get up and John gets on stage and he does the acoustic thing and he plays the guitar and he decides that it's out of tune. So he hands it to the guitar tech. And the guitar like, fucking bullshit. This guitar is perfectly in tune. So John's up there without a band, without a guitar. And, he decides, he, go, he, he says to her, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, I haven't got anything. Oh, well, I suppose I'd better tell a joke. Heard any good jokes recently? No. <laughs> so he, he decides to tell a joke. Now, one of the things that you've got to remember, this is straight after 9-11. So the police are like, you know, treated a, a venerable, you know, yep. organisation, given what, what had happened during 9-11. And also the use of the word cunt in America is a very different thing to how it is in New Zealand to how it is in Australia. There's no kind of like warm, kind of you know affectionate version of cunt up there, right? Yeah. yeah. 
So we're, we're, the room's packed and it's full of all these CEOs and we've done okay. So, you know, you know, and the idea is to walk out of there. There's an after party arranged and everything like that, you know, one of those Hollywood after parties where we're going to, you know, bro down and high five each other on how, you know, how well the, the signing's gone. Anyway, so John gets up and he tells this joke and the joke is, he goes, so uh, what kind of animal has a cunt halfway up its back? And the crowd kind of goes, ooh, like that. And he goes, ha, a police horse. And um, <laughs> <laughs> no. and, and so, the, and honestly, all these labels just evaporated. Like me and Carl just like hit under this thing. It was just like, it was fun. I mean, you know, when you think about it now, it's a fucking cracker joke for yeah. that environment. It's hilarious. But basically we walked out of there. Our manager at the time was speechless, couldn't talk to us afterwards. And we're, we're invited to this party, and this is, I suppose, the kicker. John was like, I'm so fucking sorry I fucked that up. The room went to about, you know, it went from, you know, to about 20% of the room left. It was really one of those kind of, you know, clear the room vibes. And we went to the party afterwards, and we're, like, in the line waiting to get in. We're not on the guest list. We're ringing up our management team, and they go, yeah, 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 I'll come down and sort it in a minute. And we're, like, you know, five minutes later, hey, you coming down? Yeah, 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 just give me a minute. And it's, like, half an hour later, they're not picking up the phone. It's, like, you got struck off the guest list for your own party. <laughs> oh, my God. Check out Shehard at shehard.com and facebook.com forward slash shehard. You can also check out Triple V Management at facebook.com forward slash vvvmgmt and vvvmgmt.com. While you're there, you might as well check out Home Surgery Recordings at facebook.com forward slash home surgery recordings and homesurgeryrecordings.com. Next is Teresa Bergman from episode 28. Teresa is a singer and guitarist based in Berlin. Um, yeah, so two terrible gigs spring to mind. Mm -hmm. um, one is actually a busking story. I don't know if that counts as a gig. It's a gig. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so um, one time when I was busking, I have, I used to have this really beautiful um, old leather um, photo bag, like one of the bags that they used to put old cameras in. Yep. yep. And that was my money box that yep. I'd put out the front with signage and everything and my CDs in it. Um, yeah, and it was this beautiful raw leather. And this uh, homeless guy just comes up and sort of looks at me for a little bit with his dog. And then his dog just sort of slowly walks, I'm like singing, slowly walks towards the box, <laughs> lifts his leg. No. <laughs> and just pees right in my oh, leather money box. On, your money. <laughs> <laughs> on the leather, you yeah. know. And I'm just like, you know, speechless. You know, stop singing like, uh, um, can you stop your dog? And the guy just starts laughing. <laughs> So I had to get the box cleaned and oh, pick no. up the urination money. Oh, no. <laughs> what do you do with peed on money? Just wash it. Just wash it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was going to throw awful. it away. <laughs> so I mean, it is kind of funny <laughs> from this perspective, but also. But really like, yeah. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> borderline behavior. So that was one gig that, I mean, you almost had to laugh, but yeah. yeah. And the other one would probably be was with I was playing with a trio and we were on tour and this was the last gig of the tour and we were super tight and um, amped for the last show and it was a really nice venue this old sort of um, farmhouse type venue mm. like beautiful acoustics great sound you know good two three hundred people could fit in that venue we'd done a lot of promotion we did all this newspaper coverage and sort of felt like we'd done everything right going into the gig. Yeah. And we'd played there the year before and had like half full and so we thought, you know, the next time you get more hopefully mm, is yeah. the idea. Yeah, and then um, shortly before the show, it was really it was really rainy that, that night, like really stormy. That was probably one factor against us. But um, I was sort of warming up my voice backstage and um, and my manager came in with this big, big whopper glass of whiskey and was like, hey, do you want a drink? And I was like, oh, God. How bad is it? <laughs> and, um, and, he, and he was like, uh, high five. <laughs> and there were five people there. Oh, no. And, you know, sometimes that shit happens, right? And so yeah. you're like, okay, I have a bit of a golden rule. As long as there's more people in the audience than on the stage, you got to rock that shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we went out there, you know, still determined, mm. disappointed, but determined. Yep. 
<laughs> and then we had this keyboard, this really old keyboard in the set, and our bass player was doing a bit of multitasking. He was playing bass and keys, keys at the same time. And it had one of those little, um, those little, what are they called, like dials that, that um, change the tone of the keyboard. Okay, yeah. Like a, what, like a transpose? Yeah, thing? like a transpose um, circular dial that you can hit to and fro. Yeah, yeah. And we didn't realise that someone had hit it and like built, like when we were setting up the keyboard. Oh, so, it's not, not one of the ones that springs back. So it goes, nah. yeah. And um, so it was like quarter of a tone or half a tone out and mm. we started the first song with the mm. keyboard. <laughs> so that came in and then we came in with the bass and the guitar, right? And we were just oh, no. cr like cringingly out of tune with them. We're thinking, oh God. And so we're trying to tune our you know, instruments, presuming the keyboard's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that starts failing. As I start try madly trying to tune the guitar, I break not one but two strings. And then in the kerfuffle, sort of looking at all this, our drummer threw his drumstick at the audience. <laughs> and this all sort of happened like this weird domino effect. In the first song? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. It was just, and then at that point I just cracked up laughing, just stopped playing and was like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. And uh, sat down on the, went and got my strings, sat down on the stage, um, took the mic away and just said, hey guys, I'm Teresa. Do you want to go around and we'll just introduce ourselves? We may as well get to know each other. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they were great, and we had a great night together. Then all five of them stayed till the end. Yeah, okay, um, that's good. We sort <laughs> Audience of, retention. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> it was actually hilarious because like a week later, um, we were at sort of a bit of a snazzy networking do, my manager and I, and we um, we were sort of standing there, and there was a whole group of bookers who book for people who are quite big. And a lot more successful than we are, mm. and um, and so they were saying, "Oh, you played, you know, this particular venue on tour. That's great, but you know, two, three hundred capacity. That's cool that you're getting there." And um, so tell us about the gig, Teresa. How was it? And I, I just sort of thought, okay, what can I say? And I went, you know what? It was a real highlight for us too. It was the only gig that we sold a CD to every member of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Look up Teresa online at TeresaBergman.com and Facebook.com forward slash TeresaBergman.music. Next up is Eric Jernigan from episode 19. Eric is the guitarist and vocalist for Philadelphia post-metal band Rosetta. Yeah, so uh, the first time City of Ships toured in Europe uh, was 2009, and uh, we went through uh, the border crossing from France into the UK, and uh, this guy the immigration agent just saw us as a band from a mile away. And, uh, it was definitely a, a DIY kind of tour. We forewent the, the proper work visas we were required to have to play in the UK. Yeah. And, uh, the, 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 the guy did everything short of call us out, um, for, for entering illegally. And so we were headed for a, a city called Stoke on Trent. And, uh, I guess it's in the middle of England. I'm not even sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so after this harrowing day where we barely got into the country, <laughs> this guy, uh, was on the tour with us, was driving the van uh, without a license, we found out, and uh, he backed the van into an Audi at a gas station about oh, no. 20 minutes from the venue. So, yeah, the cops came and the whole thing, and, and we realized we were there without uh, without work visas. And, yeah, I don't know. We, we definitely thought for a second, I think we're all going home. You know, we're going to be arrested and, <laughs> and taken away. We're here in the country <laughs> illegally on, you know, false premise and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, we got to the gig um, and found it was this very uh, cold, sort of cavernous upstairs venue uh, with a <laughs> very harrowing load in, you know, slippery stairs and all this kind of shit. Yeah. And what what should we see but like a horde of teenagers waiting to come inside the venue? And and I, I just I looked at them and I thought these people are too young or, or too, I don't know, modern looking, if you will, to possibly be here for our show. But there was clearly nothing else happening in this building that we could tell. Yeah. And so we thought, yeah, there's going to be like a couple hundred people at our first ever show in the UK. This is great. So we got all set up and uh, the voltage converter failed as we as we did a sound check. And oh. so uh, one of my pedals just literally burned up right on the spot. Then uh, all was fixed and we got got ready to go. And, uh, you know, we're standing around having a beer, waiting for people to come upstairs. And all of a sudden we heard this just bumping music coming from downstairs, like some <laughs> kind of modern pop music and realized like, oh, that's like a, a high school graduation party, you know? And so, yeah, at the end of the end of the day, I think there were about five paying people for our, our first show oh, uh, in the UK and the smoking pedal. And then we had to load out uh, through 
a horde of shit faced drunk teenagers oh, and man. and someone puked in, in the path <laughs> as we carried out the gear. Yeah. So that was our welcome to England. <laughs> Check out Rosetta at rosettaband.com and facebook.com forward slash Rosetta Band. Now it's Dave Baxter from episode 25. Dave is a singer and guitarist who writes and performs under the name Avalanche City. It was just when kind of everything was kind of blowing up and uh, I was um, kind of gone into over to Australia and we were starting to like work through Australian radio stations and TV stations and things like that. And my label, Warner, had um, had organised this like showcase gig. So they, what, they, what they do yep. is they organise a showcase gig and, and all of the industry people kind of come and, and you play your set and you try and be cool to these industry people yeah. who, who've, who've been to a thousand other showcase gigs that week. Yeah. And um, that was on like a, I don't know, it was like a Tuesday or something like that. And, and I'd flown over that, that same morning and, um, and so I was absolutely shattered. But um, one guy, one crucial Australian news or like TV station bigwig couldn't make the showcase gig. And... Um, they were gutted about it. They Warner were absolutely gutted that this guy couldn't come because he was such a big player. Mm. And they were like, all right, this guy can't make it for the gig, but he can make it at 10 a.m. So we're going to get you off the plane straight to the bar at 10 a.m. and you're going to play your set just to him. Just to him. He's going to be... <laughs> so <laughs> we got off the off the off the plate we'd got a i'd gotten up at like 4 30 in the morning or something like that i was absolutely shattered and we drove to the um to this bar and we set up and we do a little sound check and then this dude in a suit like rolls in and he sits down in this chair in the center of the of the <laughs> bar with no one else in the room oh and we're just on stage and i was like this is my life now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so we just like, we just played and I like tried to like pretend that he wasn't there and I tried to like have a good time and like, and there were just times where I was just laughing. Like there's, only, there's the only, the only thing that you can do in that scenario is just laugh because like, oh, it's man. just so ridiculous. And then one at the end of the, at the end of the gig, one of the, one of the people were like either bar staff or Warner staff or something came up and they're like, did you see he tapped his foot at the end of that? Did you see he, in the middle of that song he tapped his, he was tapping his foot. That means he likes it. <laughs> it's like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's just another world. Um, so that was, that was one of the worst gigs. Oh, it wasn't one of the worst. It's just one of the, up there. And, um, and then uh, the other gig was, um, it could have been the worst moment of my life. We were playing a gig in Manila yeah in the philippines and um it was at a festival and we'd kind of got there um a couple of days early and the the people who organized the festival had these like each band had someone in charge of them and and they kind of like didn't let us leave the hotel unless we were under under bodyguard and and like all that kind of stuff they were really like super paranoid and we wanted to go explore the culture and like see some markets and things like that and they they wouldn't let us because they didn't want us getting food poisoning or anything like yeah, that, yeah, or like yeah. Yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. like that, just before the gig. And so we had to eat at all these like Western places, which we were like, ah, oh, we're in Manila, and we should be like eating whatever the Manila <laughs> Manilaians eat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you to call them, but um, the show day came around, and and we were band before us was playing, and then half an hour before, I think it was actually maybe like 20 minutes before we were due on stage, I just like felt my belly start like rumbling and turning and stuff and I was like oh that doesn't feel good and then it like just started going nuts and then 10 minutes before we were due on stage I was like <laughs> oh I like ran to the portaloo and just like <laughs> like <laughs> this is a really bad story no. to tell but I absolutely yeah. bombed no, the crap good, out of this, this like toilet <laughs> And then I just had to go on stage straight after that, like with my belly just like, like going no. ballistic. <laughs> and I was just like, this could be this could be the moment where I like, crap myself on stage. Oh, shit. <laughs> and you can't you can't stop like so like because they've flown you over there for for the show you know so yeah. you can't you can't you can't pull out you can't be like hey I'm not feeling very good so I went on stage green as anything. I must have like looked as white as a ghost, 
and started playing. Once I started playing, it kind of went away. And then halfway, I was, I was like, oh, I think I've got away with this. And then halfway through the set, my belly starts doing that thing again. And I could feel it. I was just like, oh, oh. No. it started churning. And, um, and I like powered on through it. it nothing, nothing happened. But I was just, <laughs> there, if I was off the stage, I would have ran to the loo and just like bombed it. But yeah. I, I couldn't do that because I was in the middle of a song. So I was just like, well, it's either going to happen or it's not. <laughs> I'll just got to keep playing. <laughs> and, and I was, thank God it, nothing happened, but it could have been like the worst gig ever. But uh, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. That is amazing. Just that, uh, looking off and I can just imagine you looking off into space, <laughs> like wondering, is, <laughs> yeah, is, this, yeah. is this the time where I shit myself in front of thousands of yeah. people? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the, it's the, it's the fear, right? It's, there's the absolute fear and it's not, not really under your control. <laughs> You're at the mercy of your bells. <laughs> Check out Avalanche City at avalanchecity.com and facebook.com forward slash avalanche city. Next up is my guest from episode 26, Albert Ross. Albert is a multi-talented musician from Yorkshire who is based in New Zealand. Shit, I'm not sure if I should talk about this because the band still don't know it was me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they'll hear it. They're all in the UK, but... Uh... So like just just prior to moving into New Zealand, I was playing with a, a very well known band in the UK called the Pigeon Detectives. Yeah, I mean they're platinum selling band, and you know I was lucky enough to tour with them for a couple of years, do some pretty big gigs. Uh, I was playing keyboard and guitar for them, and uh, yeah. So when I first joined, uh, to cut a long story short, I had uh, they drafted me in. I got the job. I had uh, two weeks to learn three albums of theirs uh, to play uh, an arena tour. So wow. up to 20,000 people a night was wow. supporting a band called James, which was huge in the UK yeah. from uh, back in the 90s. So we did the first gig was Hammersmith Apollo, absolutely shitting myself. Uh, did that. That was the first time I'd done a really big gig. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is pretty good. I used to have a sampler on stage because there was some timpani rolls at the bridge of this uh, song that they did. Mm. Brrr, dum, dum, sort of off this sampler. So I was like, oh, yeah, that, that's all set up. But... When you're doing gigs at that level, you don't really set your own gear up, you know? You have a guy that sets it all up, so I'm just in the dressing room, having a couple of beers, being nervous, trying not to be nervous, and now I walk on stage and play. So I go on stage, but what uh, the guy who set all my keyboards up, even though, you know, he's being taught how to do it, there's different banks on the on the sampler. Mm. Bank A, B, C, and D, for example. So Bank A has got the timpani rolls on. Bank C has got a workshop on that uh, just been doing with some disabled children uh, in Blackpool, where we were getting them to do vocalizations and stuff, and that was all on, <laughs> you see where I'm going, <laughs> all on Bank B that I should have yeah. probably deleted from like six months ago, but I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, this was at Brixton Academy, one of the venues that I dreamed of playing when I was a kid, so yeah. it was a big deal for me, and sold out gig, and uh, got to the bit where the song drops down, all quiet, and uh, in come the timpani rolls, and so this is like, <laughs> it's like, it's like the loudest sound you've ever heard. It's like, oh, like 5,000 people, like, what? and all the band like what and I was just like just carried on playing keyboards and like oh man I was sweating I was like I was trembling after that I was like at the time I didn't really know what it was and yeah as I was finishing the song I was working out in my head oh shit that, that was, oh my god I can't believe that's what it was anyway I got in the dressing room afterwards and the band were all like what the hell was that in that song but not to me just to each other and I was yeah, like know. no one seems to know where it came from and then the bass player goes Oh, he says to the singer because the singer in the band uh, check him out on YouTube they're amazing he swings the mic around a lot and he, he destroys a few mics during most gigs and so he, there's always spare mics at the front just taped down for him to pick up yep. and the sound man is supposed to leave them switched off obviously but they, they went oh the sound man must have left with their mics on and someone on the front rows grabbed him going, oh, so I was like oh. yeah so yeah that was it <laughs> they, they, they don't know about that <laughs> so hopefully they do they now yeah, yeah they won't be listening to this hopefully but uh, the young lad who uh, whose family we know well still. Uh, a young lad called Ollie who was in the workshop, who was doing the vocalizations and stuff with. We got to tell him and his family that he'd just been on at Brixton Academy and they were stoked. Yeah. <laughs> so, so she just played Brixton Academy sort of. For more of Albert and his music, check out equalvoicesarts.com forward slash productions and facebook.com forward slash Albert Ross official. Next up, it's Sarah Court. Sarah was my guest on episode 27. She's a classical singer and a doctor of musical arts. This is quite brave, me telling you this story, because okay. <laughs> it's a big employer, and it's empl an employer I would love to work for. I would love to work for again. You don't have to say the name of, of the employer if you want. It'll be really obvious. Um, <laughs> but it's my biggest gig. It was my biggest money gig, and it was the worst gig 
of my life. So I sang at the world premiere of the Lord of the Rings Symphony. Wow. And it was a big gig. Yeah. And it was a very big deal. So I was very excited. I was hired, as were a couple of other classical singers, because in the score it said mezzo-soprano soloist and I believe it said lyric soprano soloist and baritone soloist. So they were classical terms. Mm -hmm. We prepared our music and we showed up at the rehearsals and it was very, um, it was quite overwhelming for a young singer. I was very young at the time, 23, 24, something like that. There were a lot of American movie people there Mm -hmm. because it was, you know, it was the premiere of the third movie and it was the premiere of the symphony at the same time. So the big actors were there. Wow. The parts I had been contracted to sing were uh, a bit where they're in with the elves and Galadriel, the kind of chant stuff yep. that happens there. And then two songs that happen over the credits of the second movie and then over the credits of the third movie. The one over the credits of the third movie was going to be at the end of the whole symphony. And these songs... I. Maybe, you know, I should have done my homework or I couldn't have on the third one, but uh, they were in studio sung by a Björk-like singer and by Annie Lennox. Oh, wow. So not by actual classical singers. And I didn't know that. I just learned it in my classical voice. I learned it. Howard Shaw was conducting. He had written the pieces. He'd written the music for Lord of the Rings and he was conducting. And so we sang through the very first rehearsal. I did the best that I could. And I was immediately swamped afterwards by American producers and assistants and assistants of assistants going, oh, my God, what are you doing? You're murdering this music. It's awful. And I was like, oh, my God. Sorry, what? Sorry, sorry. You know, my Kiwi classical colleagues were all there going, oh, good job, Sarah. You know, well done. The American visitors were horrified. They were absolutely horrified. They were like, okay, we've got to get you into coaching. So we've got to fix this. This is awful. Because, of course, I didn't sound like a Bjork style singer and I didn't sound like Annie Lennox and I didn't know to take the classical out and mm. oh wow and there was a very famous conductor there classical conductor helping Howard I won't name him but we were put into coaching with this great classical conductor the kind of person I would love to be in front of if you know if I were auditioning for something your big opportunity to sing for sure person x yeah and here I am singing this music where I've been told I'm awful and it's terrible and we get into the coaching the next morning and he says to me well you might as well just pack up and go home because this music is for a pop singer and you're clearly a Marla singer like he got he said I got your music DNA right away you are this kind of singer like he pinpointed me right away and he just said it's a waste of time you even being here. And I'm just that in tears. Oh, my God. Like, oh, God, oh, God. It was, uh, to this day, I mean, I did everything I could. I was, I, I took the coaching really seriously. I tried to change as much as I could. And we got into rehearsals with the orchestra, which is the NZSO. So, hi, NZSO. Thanks so much for this gig. <laughs> um, my whisker giver. They were lovely, actually. The orchestra were really nice about it. They were so nice to me. The players were amazing. So mm. many of them came up and said, you're doing great. Don't worry. Because I was clearly terrified. Yeah. Uh, and I did what I could. And I tried not to sing too classical or anything like that. And I continued to get the feedback that I was really awful from the American visitors. <laughs> and there, basically, we had... I think it was two rehearsals with the orchestra and then the performance. Might not even have been that. It's it's a while since mm. this. And I showed up to like the dress rehearsal after I'd had a run through with the orchestra and they had gotten rid of me without telling me. Oh, they my God. They had cut me. <laughs> um, so they had cut me Why from... Why didn't they tell you? Well, they told me when I showed up. Oh. So they cut me from... They kept me on the little chant... Bit. They said that I could keep doing that, but they cut me from the two big songs. Shit. And yeah, it was, it was, I was so mortified. I was so embarrassed because this was happening to me in front of the NZSO who had employed me. People I would love to have employ me in the future, you know, so that was horrifying. Plus huge numbers of my friends and colleagues in the choirs. And um, I think the National Youth Choir was singing in that and, you know, Big deal, big deal local people who yep. would give me future jobs. Yep. And I was 
basically, you know, being cut in front of them. <laughs> I was so mortified. Check out Sarah online at sarahcourtmezzo.co.nz and facebook.com forward slash sarahcourtmezzo. Now we have Karen McMeekin from episode 24. Karen is a singer and guitarist. The, the one that pops out the most to me was uh, last summer. I think I was at Waihi Beach Hotel. And it was super chill night. There was like, honestly, there's probably like 10, 15 people just sprawled out on beanbags. And I was just kind of just playing, you know, it was pretty chill. And there was one guy who was like ready to rage. He was ready to party. And he was just like, hey, you play shock. He was just on his own little planet. But he had spoons. He, was, he wanted to play along with spoons. And I like, when people want to engage and like drum along and stuff, I'm generally like, yeah, like get involved. You know, that's kind of one of those in the moment things that can generally go really well, you know, and the person knows what they're doing. But this guy was woeful at spoons. He was just sort of had them together and just sort of hitting them together as hard as he could, completely out of time. And spoons are quite, they're quite shrill. They actually yeah, carry a long way. It's like a tambourine. They they, through. So yeah. <laughs> I was playing. And he was just up the front sort of trying to jam along, but he was just the most obnoxious spoon noise you could ever imagine, just blaring. And and it, it was just totally took away from the experience as well. Ever, I was just looking at the crowd and they were just like, oh, my God. Yeah. And I was like, I said, I had to say to him, I said, dude, like, I really appreciate you, like, wanting to, like, jam along and stuff, but this is just not working at all. Like, this is this is absolutely terrible. And I need you to stop. And he, <laughs> <laughs> and he was, he didn't like that at all. He got quite aggressive and started get, getting up and, and trying to take my guitar off me and everything. And it was just really tragic. The security had to come over and get rid of him. And it was just, I almost felt for the guy, you know, like this was his big shot, you know, and he was like, this is it, you know, this is, yeah, I've been working my whole life for this moment, you know, and here I am. You just had one too many drinks. Yeah. And he, yeah. One too many yeah. yeah, yeah quite and the, you know, the asshole musician just shut him down in his oh. moment of glory. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was his worst gig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and only gig. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's probably it. Probably takes the cake for just not worst gig, but just sort of like most kind of obnoxious moment within a gig. Yeah. That, that you know, or like heckler. Yeah. You know. Amazing. Yeah. You can check out Karen McMeekin at facebook.com forward slash Karen McMeekin and Karen dot com. Now we have Jasper Hawkins, also from episode twenty four. Jasper is a singer and guitarist. It's kind of worse slash, I think, l- luckily enough, I've been gigging enough. I just found it really funny. I think I, I don't really mind when things go wrong now, but it was just woeful. And I'd been with, <laughs> I was playing a duo gig with uh, with, a, with my friend Johnny Blair. And we'd learnt, we we're like, yeah, let's, let's, let's figure out how to do Hotel California and we'll do the whole solo section at the end as well with the two of us. And we'd practice it at home and it sounded mint. We'd like looped up the chords so we could do it and then we could do the harmony guitars playing that. And yeah, it sounded so good. But we got to the gig and it got to the solo and I kicked the looper on and neither of us could hear where the chords were in the thing. So there was a stomp box going. So I was, I was kicking a stomp box, which started going out of time with the looper. And then my guitar was out of time to that because I was trying to hear where it was. And then Johnny was out of time to me. And I just like, I, I remember getting my ear and just leaning it right down to the amp just to see if I could hear what had happened. And I remember a whole bunch of people just walked out the door, just gone. We had them all, we had them totally captivated the whole time. And I, I got to the end, but I sort of was sort of going like, trying to, uh. oh, no, not, <laughs> trying to catch up to the loop all the time so I was quickly having sort of butcher that lick to go to the next one and couldn't figure it out and um, I just looked over at Joe I was actually la- I couldn't look at him because I was laughing so much at what was going on and I think we packed up soon after that we were just like you know what there was so much like reverb and stuff going on we couldn't hear and it was just such a din yeah god that, that, that moment yeah <laughs> you can check out Jasper Hawkins at facebook.com forward slash Jasper Hawkins music and last but not least, we have my guest from episode 21, Zoran Mendonza. Zoran is a music producer, sound engineer, and guitarist. Um, so, like, I was in that band New Way Home, and we were opening for Devin Townsend, who is yeah. one of my all, all-time favorite artists and, you know, one in my top two, probably my favorite singer. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a very special occasion. And there was one, uh, there's one song in the set where it just drops out to just me. <laughs> On the guitar, just like a little guitar break, right? So you can kind of see where this is heading. Um, and it was, it's usually, it was usually like the drummer's, the drummer kind of like just keeps count on the hi hats while I play it. 
And, you know, I know it's not very professional to do that, but that's just how we did it. And it didn't sound all that bad. But on that day, the drummer stopped doing the hi-hat thing didn't, and, and stopped hunting. So I was like, I just it just kind of took me off by surprise. And I just kind of stopped playing. I just kind of froze and I stopped playing. And I was like, yeah. oh, shit. Like I've And it was like this weird odd time thing and whatever. So there was like this just two seconds of silence where I was just like looking at the band and like, I think, you know, everyone, like it was a, it was a packed um, venue and stuff like that. But, you know, it was thankfully right before a breakdown. So I think a lot of people just thought it was like just a long pause just before the, the thing hit. And then thankfully, yeah. thankfully the other guys kind of came back in on time and then, you know, I just joined in very quickly. But that oh. was tremendously disappointing, embarrassing. Um, and, um, uh, but it also goes to show that most people can't really pick those things at gigs, so you just you're better off just like just yoloing it and just like pretending like nothing happened and just yep. just go harder after that point and you know and it's funny like that can completely make up for any mistake whatsoever if you and because as a, I think as if you're in the audience you know you, everyone every human being at some point has gone through some kind of struggle and then wanted to come out on top of that particular situation, be it personal, be it, you know, uh, a video game, whatever. So if they see that, if they see someone struggle and then just come out on top, they'll they'll be energized by it and support it, you know? So I think, yeah. So for, for, all, for, all, for the other worst gig ever um, folks out there, like, you know, uh, you yeah, just don't, don't, don't stress too much and just carry on like nothing's happened. Check out Zoran's work at facebook.com forward slash Zoran Sound. If you want to check out the band he was talking about, go to facebook.com forward slash New Way Home. And that's it for this week. What a ride. Thank you so much to all the guests for sharing their stories. You'll find links to all of the web pages of all guests and their projects in the podcast description. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast and like the brand new Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash musicians map. And keep an eye out because next week I've got something really special for you. This podcast and the website musiciansmap.org is dedicated to sharing knowledge and advice about music and the music industry. It's all about community, honesty and positive progress. The experiences, stories and advice shared on the podcast are given freely with the hope that you can relate to them and benefit from them. If you've found this podcast enjoyable or useful, make sure to check out the Musician's Map ebook and audiobook about building success in music. You'll find it at musiciansmap.org forward slash books, Amazon and Audible. And buying a copy of the book directly contributes to the continuation of this podcast. There's also a free ebook, How to Get Your Music Heard. Go to musiciansmap.org forward slash free dash book to get your copy. If you have a suggestion for the podcast or for the YouTube channel, or you just want to get in touch and say hello, please do so via the Musicians Map Facebook group or by email at kane at musiciansmap.org. Thanks for listening and stay positive.